Hello, Dr. Dyke Drummond here at the home of TheHappyMD.com in beautiful Seattle, Washington. Welcome to the latest episode of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. Tools so you can recognize and prevent your own burnout. Stories of burnout put to its highest and best use and wellness leadership strategies. Everything you need to be a physician on purpose. Hello again, Dr. Dyke Drummond here with the latest edition of the Physicians on Purpose podcast coming to you from beautiful Seattle, Washington and the home of thehappymd.com. And I've got a real treat here for those of you who want to dive into the friction between physicians and clinicians and business people and what goes on inside the mind of an entrepreneurial physician, because I've got Dr. Zwade Marshall, MD, MBA, who is an anesthesiologist and an interventional pain specialist who owns his own practice down in Fayetteville, Georgia, and is also a serial entrepreneur. And one of the ventures that I came to know him through is one called doc2doclending.com, which loans money to physicians that banks Um, won't loan, especially if you have a lot of debt, but you're going to be a doctor earning money down the road. We're going to talk about all of those businesses, but we're also going to talk about what got him into MB, MBA, serial starting of his companies, including a COVID testing company he'll tell this story about, what got him there, what ticks in his head, how he's different than doctors, all the lessons he's learned about business. Dr. Marshall, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. That's a, a warm introduction. I much appreciate it, and I'm happy to be here with you. Okay, so how did a guy from Guyana get to Fayetteville, Georgia, and own three businesses? Can you tell us just a little <laughs> bit about the story? Yeah, I have a, I have a mom who had a, a dream for her kids, uh, and um, uh, at the time when I was uh, in, in a teenager in high school, the next step after you do well in high school in Guyana is to go to college unfortunately somewhere else uh the the tertiary education system is not very developed and so many of my peers and I we go abroad and very few of us go back unfortunately so um so we moved initially to uh to New Jersey uh I got a scholarship to Emory um with the thought that I was going to be pre-med uh I, I studied economics nonetheless um even though I was pre-med and and uh taught high school mathematics for a year after college oh wow uh, in an inner city high school in in Decatur Georgia and then went on to medical school um residency and then fellowship and then after fellowship uh in uh in in, at Harvard in Boston I decided to come back uh to quote unquote home court advantage to the city that I thought I had the most developed network to build a business um uh to your to the the kind of point of this of this uh this conversation it, 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 there was some forethought in what what would increase the odds of success if i were to uh kind of fulfill fulfill my dream of owning my own practice and building out a surgery center in atlanta had very specific characteristics that i thought were friendly to me uh as a person and as a professional and, and so when you scanned your universe at that point in your life by the way did you have your mba by then i did yes I did. so here you are You've got your fellowship, you're an interventional pain specialist, you got an MBA. And when you scanned the universe, you said, I'm going to build, I'm going to build and own my company. I'm not going to sign on as an employee pain medicine guy for a hospital in town or anything like that. What do you think gave you that drive to want to be the owner, the founder, the, the boss? I think a couple of things. And I, I, to be honest with you, though, I came out of fellowship and joined a large private practice group first. Ah. I thought the most efficient path to me owning my own practice was to have someone pay me to learn. And being a part of that group where I had, a, I was director of medical outcomes. I was on the medical executive committee. I was a part of all of the kind of decisioning around the KPIs, the key performance indices around success for that group. What were the revenue drivers? Where were the cost centers? I understood that because of that job. I knew it in theory by having an MBA, but the practice of medicine and some of the medical economics, the payer reimbursement stuff, I learned at that, at that practice. And I'm forever grateful for that kind of front row seat 
into the business of medicine. After I'd spent um, four years there, I decided that it was time that I had enough savings. Um, I had enough uh, confidence in my ability to not just clinically practice medicine because I had that confidence, I think maybe two years into practice. You always leave training a little bit nervous, right? The, those of us that are, you, you've got a humility for the craft. So uh, so I, I felt that I was a confident practitioner maybe two years into practicing. Um, but certainly a confident business person in medicine that can provide ethical care, that can put the priorities of my patients over those of the payers, over those of of of, of myself, and kind of like understand how the inter intersection of care and economics works. Uh, and that took me about four years. And so when I opened up, I think I was more poised for success because I'd I'd uh, I'd done some of the work for someone else, and I did it well for them. And so I just thought, how much harder would I work for myself if I were on my own? Well, and the other thing I'm noticing is that you're thinking beyond your current position at that point, right? This is a bridge to a future that you can imagine where you need this almost as an apprenticeship. What I find is that most people, especially if they're overstressed or burnout, out, are focusing on just getting through the day. And if you're in that survival mode where you're just trying to drag yourself to the end of the day, it's hard to imagine a better future, but there's always a better future. It just depends on you focusing out there and setting your current position as a bridge. And That's for, exactly correct. I'm sorry. And, and in your case, no, you're fine. And in your case, the other thing that you are is you're a two-tool player. I'm just going to point that out. Two-tool player. So at the same time you're doing clinical, you also have the ability to maintain a second awareness on the business principles behind it. You can see the numbers through the wall, like in the end of the Matrix movie for the business. They're typically invisible for the average doctor, right? Right. That's a good analogy. I think um, I think it's quite uh, ironic and also sad. Uh, and what you pointed out about about most of us are not able to think past the current stresses that exist in our lives as we're burning out. That's why it's so valuable what you do for for doctors out there in helping to coach them through burnout and the stressors that are associated with medicine. I think that inherently, though, those of us that choose this career of servitude, we know how to delay gratification. There's no way that you sit in that library at midnight in your mid-20s. Like We mortgage our youth for this promise of a future fulfilling career. And, and so we know how to do it. I think what's really disheartening is when, is when you're in it and, you're, and you realize how much of a bum deal it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when that burnout and stress takes hold of you, you're right, you can't see out of it. Uh, and and so, so many of us struggle with kind of maintaining ourselves, trying to figure out what makes us happy, what was the reason to go into medicine to begin with. Uh, and, and it's oftentimes uh, the, the, the paperwork, the, the bureaucracy that kind of distracts from exactly what we wanted to do. And it's increasingly harder today to own and run your own practice in medicine and have a joy for it while managing all of the other pressures that come with owning a business, especially the health healthcare business. Well, and the big switch comes, uh, if you think about it, if you're an employee doctor, uh, just think back to when you got the job. Uh, what role did you play in your current job description? Because I know it's zero because the person who was interviewing you pulled a job description off the rack. And what is that job description meant to do? It's meant to satisfy the business model and the revenue model of your employer. It's really got sure. nothing to do with you whatsoever. The cleanest way to take charge of your job description is to make it yourself which is what you do as an entrepreneur. Uh, for those of you who don't have the, have the knowledge and the comfort level and the abilities to create your own practice, the best thing you can do is figure out what your ideal practice is and understand how to find it and negotiate it for it as an employee. You can do that too. You don't have to own your own business to get much more satisfaction with your practice at this point. So here we are, you're in Atlanta. You got four years under your belt. You're ready to start your practice. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. So I did a demographic survey uh, uh, to figure out, you know, once I thought through my non-compete zone and my restrictive covenants, where exactly did I think that I 
that was the location in the suburban Atlanta area that had the kind of right confluence of factors to support a business like mine. Uh, I do spine interventions and, and joint injections. And so having an aging population is going to be a good thing for me. Um, uh, the, knowing that because of the way uh, the kind of insurance world works, having a peer mix that was favorable was also going to be important uh, uh, for my practice. Uh, knowing what the competition landscape looked like, where were, how many docs that did what I do were within 5, 10, 15 square miles? And, and importantly, where were the referral sources? Were there any large hospital systems that did not have in-house interventional pain management that could refer me patients? Were there any neurosurgeons and orthospine docs who need to have injection therapy done before they can get their surgical procedures approved? So that analysis led me to Fayetteville um, and, uh, and, and being keen to understand the fact that in 2000, and this was 2021 when I did this, 2020, sorry, end of 2020, um, that the patients were a lot had a lot more agency in where they where they're seen than 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 historical. So before you relied upon referrals mostly as a tertiary specialist to get business. Today, patients use Google, they use top docs, they use social media and online marketing to make a determination about how good of a fit you were for, for their needs. And so understanding that my online presence was going to be as important as my relationship building with referral doctors was, I think, pivotal in me helping to grow the business. And, and so uh, curating the kind of profile that, that, that shared that I was well-trained, I'm dual board certified, I went to elite schools, but I'm also from a single parent household, I've been a patient myself. I understand what the, 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 the triggers and the, 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 the anxieties about seeing a doctor could be. Uh, I know that people are afraid of the overly paternalistic uh, uh, doctors who don't, who don't sit down in an exam room, but stand at the door, they say what to do and then they leave. Like, I think I had the right confluence of personality features and factors with experiences with the business background and knowing that these things that are in my personality would appeal to most people, um, knowing how to package that into a marketing brochure or on a website and speak to the audiences in a way that will resonate with them, I thought uh, was going to be helpful and, and it, it helped. So everybody who's listening right now, listen to the depth of the analysis that it takes with an MBA. You learn these kind of things, right? The depths of the market study, and the depths of the marketing plan, just listen to the business principles it takes to make this independently and realize that for whatever reason, Dr. Marshall is wired that when he sees a problem, he makes a business. <laughs> so, so just notice that that's why a lot of us are intimidated by, by the feeling that the option is employee or build your own practice. And this is the kind of knowledge base that you have to have. It's not true. You can find a much more rewarding practice in your employee position if you just know what your ideal practice is, which is one of the principles that we teach. So here you are launching your practice. I want to point out 2020, right? And so he's doing it into the teeth of a hurricane of COVID. And then another problem came along and you made another business. Tell us about that. Sure. I think, um, I, you know, many of us, the pandemic changed the way we view our jobs, our priorities, our family. There was, you were forced to be, you know, uh, to stay still for a moment. And we're used to kinetic energy and the movement and it's, an, it's the studying, it's the, the working, it's the hours. And I think I had a, an epiphany like many millions of Americans did, where I decided that it was the time for me to make, to make the leap, to kind of fulfill my life's ambition, to be my own boss and to run my own practice. And the timing there was actually fortuitous because no one else was looking for real estate space. So the <laughs> landlords were begging me to take space in their buildings. And so I got super discounts and lots of what they call tenant improvement allowances and and uh, and uh, a long period of no no rent uh, payments needed. And then because many of 
of the, the doctor's offices in my field were not deemed to be uh, those, those like medically necessary uh, services, they closed down. And so I opened up and said, look, if you've been in pain and you've used to seeing a doctor and they're now closed, come see me and I'll, I'll see you virtually as well. So, so that helped me to create another avenue for, for, for patient engagement. Um, and I think overall, the COVID experience was one in which if my business can, can grow during that time, with the pressures and capital, the pressures on patient flows and, 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 and communicating transportation needs and also communicating testing needs. So in order to stay open and be compliant with all the laws that were being put down by Medicare, you had to have a way to test your patients. And so I invested in a COVID lab. I remember calling my wife and telling her the, the six-figure costs of this secondary business after we'd spent multi-six figures on the primary business um, and I was sphincter tight for, uh, for a few <laughs> months and then, um, and then it all began to like, there, there was a real need, you know, um, not only did my patients need to get tested before their procedures, but many of them were getting sick and, uh, needed to travel to see loved ones for holidays. And, and, uh, they told their peers and their friends and family about us. And we, I, I I'm proud to say that we had a 48 hour turnaround time for 90% of the pandemic. Uh, there were those peak times at Thanksgiving and Christmas where all of my clinical staff, including my OR techs, became lab employees because of just the sheer volume of, of cases that we had. Um, uh, but it was over, it was an overwhelmingly stressful environment. It put me to my limits in terms of operational capacity because that is an operational business. Uh, it's a it's a low margin, high volume business. And so having the operational excellence to deliver on your promise to the patients. Your, my value proposition was, if you come get a test with me, then you're going to get a result at the time I tell you you'll get the result for you to plan your travel or your job start or whatever it is. And the big, my competition, the, the big labs, the, the lab cores and the quests, they were having week-long delays because they just, you know, were, were having so much volume. And 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 if I, my promise to my customers and my, my patients uh, we'll, we'll continue to grow and we were able to do so. Um, and, um, and the times when we did not, we were extraordinarily customer facing, apologetic and transparent about where we are and what the struggles were. And folks just happened to appreciate that. And I'd call them myself. It wasn't, well, a lot of them, not all of them, but, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, a customer service or a front desk person making the calls. And what was your peak volume and at the height of the testing? Yeah, so we did uh, twelve thousand eight hundred tests in one month, and that was it. <laughs> that was that was the that was it was a four week span. That the four weeks began on the twenty third of December in twenty twenty one, into the January sixteenth uh, uh, of twenty 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 two. And right now we're in May May ninth of twenty twenty three, and you're telling me that that business is going to wind down now because the mandates are gone, right? That's correct. Yeah, so we're doing a few hundred tests currently and uh, will likely do no tests probably in the next four weeks. A good run though. Yes. Without question. Okay, Without question. good. <laughs> <laughs> Without question. And you know, like that, that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, success um, operationally and then financially, the reward you get from that allows you to make investments into the business uh, and create the infrastructure and elevate systems for growth and scale on the primary business, but other ancillaries that that are that are tied to that primary business. So I think in our in our world as doctors, there's so much of an ecosystem of revenue generating activities that we can perform if you just know how to build your businesses around your primary business. And 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 to do so compliantly is is always a challenge. But having good a, a good legal advisory team that can help you understand where the pitfalls are the structures of the organizations and the companies, I think is going to be important. And then also staying true to medical necessity, which is the underpinning of anything that, that you order or do. There should be a medically justifiable reason for doing so. And a focus on customer service and a knowledge that you resonate as a person with the people who you're serving. You've chosen the community 
very, very deliberately. So all of this is is lined up. It's like the ducks in a row, right? So so <laughs> graduate, get your four years, build your interventional pain practice. An opportunity arises, you drop another six figures into a testing practice that works out really well for you. And then you also have this lending company, Doc to Doc Lending. Tell us what that's about. And I know there's a story here that this comes from a personal history as well. Tell us a little bit about that. It does. And I'll, I'll say that for, for many of you listening that are contemplating a business idea um, or starting something that, that you've been kind of wrestling with, I think one of the most validating data points is a lived experience. Um, if you can identify with the customer, it gives you a true north. Uh, it, you you get re and if there's a real emotional feeling, a strong emotional tie to whatever that problem was, the solution feels so rewarding that it's that success is not just the revenue or the net margins. It's also seeing others benefit from your solution uh, and not have to face the problem that you did. In my case, I was going from uh, from medical school in Atlanta to residency in Boston. I did not have the almost 20,000 bucks I needed to facilitate that transition. There was first last month's rent, broker fee, the actual relocation costs and all the other knit nats that go with starting as a, as a resident. And when I applied for loans to the banks, I saw myself as a pretty good borrower. I, I'd done everything right. I graduated from a top medical school and got into a top residency. So surely um, the banks would see this and see my promise. But they looked at my student loan debt, which was over $200,000. They looked at my income at the time, which was 54,000 bucks a year. And residents have the same income with, with some marginal geographic adjustments. And they looked at my FICO score, which was considered to be subprime not because of bad behavior, but because of the burden that educational debt has on your FICO score. And those factors made them either deny me the loan or they offered me credit card interest rates. Um, and that felt unfair. Uh, my my co-founder, uh, Dr. Kenton Allen, he had a similar experience, but not from transition. But while he was in residency, he had a family. He had a wife and three girls. And the income that we make as residents does not su adequately support life for a family of five in Boston. <laughs> and he couldn't borrow money either. So we decided to think of our cohort of physicians and think of, do we really believe that we're as unbankable as the banks think that we are? Is there a mismatch in risk reward ratio and, 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 and the way they, they charge us in terms of interest rates? And so we devise an algorithm that's more thoughtful. It's more physician-centered. We care about how many years you have left in training as a part of the underwriting criteria. We care about what's your specialty, where you're going to be in the country for your, for your training and, and post-training. And that's able to get us more competitive interest rates with terms that are more borrower-friendly. We have no prepayment penalties. So should you pay us off quickly, we don't charge you any fees for the interest that we lose by you doing so. Because we fully expect that if you're an in-training resident when you borrow from us, that your income will change dramatically in a matter in a finite period of time. And we think you should be out of debt. And we don't want to penalize you for doing what's good for your financial future. So we tell all of our borrowers in, in their doctor to doctor consults, hey, we expect you to pay this off sooner. And if you do, we'll congratulate you for it. So we're in, we aspire to be the USAA for doctors. You want to be the company that, that if you're a doc and you think of needing something, that you have, you got this brand loyalty to the folks that treated you best when you were most vulnerable. Mm. So that in the future, when you have options, you still choose us. Gotcha. And, and just to, to put a number on the context, back when you were trying to borrow money and all they would give you was insurance, excuse me, was credit card rates. What were those rates back then? Yeah, so the rates were north of 20% for many, or I was just denied. They would say, no, we, we can't fund this loan because you don't have the right income, debt to income ratio to qualify for it. So denials were most common. And then uh, there were mid-20 approval rates. 
And you started Doc to Doc Lending when? That was so. We issued our first loan in a pilot program in June of 2019. Nice. Uh, we got uh, we raised some funds from doctors and uh, started a formal program with a bank partner uh, in 2020. Um, and uh, we've had 3x year over year growth every year since. And at this point in time, how much money have you got out in loans? Or is that a number that you track? I'm assuming it is. We do. Yeah. So we funded over $78 million in loans. Nice. All to doctors. Doctor, yes, all to doctors. So physicians and dentists. And we added a podiatrist recently. So it's oh, okay. It's all cool. Yes. Very cool. Very cool. So see a problem, make a business. See a problem, make a business. So you've got doc to doc set up. And the thing about the thing about running a business is ideally, if you founded it and you own it and you designed it, you don't work too much in it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's another one of the binds that doctors get into. Our practices des devolve into us being peace workers. That's sure. another reason why doctors are so insecure around money is because when you see money, what you think is how many patients am I going to have to see in order to make that amount of money? And uh, yeah. when you become a business owner and a business uh, creator, you can you can abstract yourself out of having to work for every dollar. That's an excellent point, Doc. Uh, and I'm, I'll tell you that I am evolving into the way you frame the question. I, I certainly am very integral to both businesses. Um, and in my practice, I think I've, over the course of the last eight months or so, began to take a step back to be more of a, a coach for coaches. So having the nurse practitioners, the partner doctors, the practice administrators in which I want to just coach them on how to be better coaches, but I don't want the problems to come to me. Uh, I still enjoy patient care, but when you smile a lot, you sit, you hold folks' hands, you cry with them when, they're, when, when someone dies, they expect you to be in that room every time they come. And that, to your point, that's not a scalable business. Um, and so how do I replicate myself in the folks that work with me? So now we have 19 full-time employees and uh, 28 in total with the, with the part-timers. Um, and having the, the right number of practice coaching opportunities to ensure that everyone kind of drinks the Kool-Aid. And coming from Guyana, I shouldn't say that. Jim Jones and the Kool-Aid happened in my country, but, but, uh, but I want to drink the Kool-Aid, uh, so to speak, and believe in the model of patient-centered care. And doc to doc, I think that uh, because we're in a non-healthcare industry, we're in fintech, and because doctors perceive bankers, and rightfully so, as being somewhat predatory on them when they're, when they're immature in, in their financial kind of wisdom, that it's important for our customers to see the, that I am a real doctor and I'm a real part of the company. And the other doctors that are part of the team are very visible. We take those borrower calls ourselves. We, it's the most expensive customer service line that you'll ever see, right? It's a, a, an army of docs who run practices. We're in business or on, on, our, on our own. So we can remain relatable to our borrowers because we're actively engaged in, in expanding practices and hiring staff and needing to access capital. And so the vis my visibility within the business is essential. But to your point, I am not the one verifying applications. I'm not the person that's speaking with our bank partners. I'm not the one negotiating the contract. I'm not the person that's actually making the sausage within the organization. I and, and our physician team, we are part of the strategic leadership apparatus that helps to ensure that our mission to be the favored provider of tailored tools, both financial and non, for physicians and dentists remains uh, paramount to, uh, to what we do. And let me just reemphasize what you said earlier, which is it's important. And this, this is something that's specific to doctors. I'm going to say that really clearly. Doctors choose to apply to medical school for non-rational reasons. If you knew what was coming, you'd have never applied. 
And what ends up happening, though, is we look to the future and imagine some situation where we're a helper and a healer and making a difference. And there's meaning and purpose in the work that we do. I can tell you that for a person who's motivated by meaning and purpose rather than money, and you're going to do a business that's other than your medical practice, it's also, I believe, very important that there be meaning and purpose in that side business for you as well. So, for instance... I quit seeing patients for insurance money. In 2000, I quit my job because of burnout, brick wall burnout, like smack your face right into a brick wall and knock yourself out kind of burnout. I haven't actually seen patients um, since 2004. At this point in time, I consider all my, and I have my quote fingers here, all my patients are doctors. So just think about that for a second. But what are we, what are we working on? What's the nature of our business relationship? It's helping them learn from and survive the wounds of burnout and the trauma of our medical experiences, right? So I know what this feels like, and I burst a coaching, training, consulting business out of that. You knew what it felt like to not be able to get loans when you desperately needed them as a person who was on an upward swing as a, as a, a, a soon-to-be practicing doctor. You, that pain is what brings you to this business. So when I see doctors that want to develop a side gig or say they want to get out of medicine, I still think you're wired like a doctor looking for some purpose and some meaning. So if, even though you may be frustrated about money, I would encourage you to, to look out for something that pulls at your heartstrings and go in that direction rather than just monetary rewards. I couldn't agree with you more. And, um, and I think um, I got to say that there, there, there needs to be a focus on fulfillment personally, but also an acknowledgement of, of your stressors. And sometimes it's a very lonely place to be when you're caring for others all the time. And uh, if you're building a business at the same time, there are pressures that you don't necessarily want to take home to your spouse. Uh, you don't want to create doubt in their minds about the endeavor that you just leveraged your savings, the collective savings to, uh, to, uh, with the hope of, <laughs> right, with the hope of building something greater. And so having a healthy process of checking where you are, how you're feeling. Um, and when it's okay to abort and say, you know what, this is not working out the way I envisioned. And, you know, a failed endeavor is just the beginning of your next successful one. You learn so much from failure, but knowing when to call it quits and not having that stress kind of snowball into really dragging you into dark places like you're describing is uh, is of the utmost importance. Cool. So just real quick, and I know this is a difficult question, but you've been an MD, MBA, a serial entrepreneur. Um, when you think about a physician's mindset and a manager's mindset and the fact that the clash of the employee physician and the healthcare manager is a big piece of why we have this 63% burnout rate these days, when you're when you're talking to a physician audience, what do we need to remember about communicating with the business side of the house? Is there anything that yeah. stands out to you as being an important insight? Yeah, no, that's that's a good one. It's a tough one because I am now also management, right? right? And so, uh, so I think to your advice to others earlier, where you said if if you're employed, you know, you know, you can create your happiness within an employed uh, constraint. That's absolutely true. I love my employees that come to me and say, here, here is my personal development plan. Here is what I want out of my time here. Here, here are my ambitions. I want to be able to, in a year's time, be eligible for promotion to do these things. So give yourself that, that agency. I think, though, doctors were trained and wired to be a couple of things, to be very data-driven. We are also um, subject matter experts. So we develop a very, very high competency. We go very deep in very narrow bands of domain at times. And so we can interact with folks with a level of expectation that they understand all the elements that inform our decisioning. And I think we're impatient with folks oftentimes that don't keep up with our pace of motivation and our, and our way of thinking about things. And so, and... I'm generalizing here. I think that there are many doctors who are not this way. 
And, uh, and there are many of us that are trained to be in high performing teams that know how to communicate effectively in a team based environment. But I think many of us just don't. And the, in the business and managerial world, there is a level of deference that I think still exists for doctors when it comes to substantive content, but there's an expectation that we don't understand the business. And so we will perceive rightfully so a level of, uh, of arrogance or, or talking at us when it comes to knowing what drives the bottom line for the organization. And there's a happy medium. I think many organizations though, are the pendulum swings more to revenue and they want to treat patients like widgets. And they act as though, you know, like you've got 12 minutes for this encounter. You got to be out of that room at 12 minutes and one second. And it doesn't matter that you're dealing with a human that presented today with an entirely different problem that had uh, an entirely different social challenge. And being a, being a part of that therapeutic alliance with a patient and doctor requires that you address those things as well. You'll never, you'll never heal the person's problem that, that's in front of you if you ignore the other aspects that are impacting on that, them in that day. And oftentimes, the practice administrators, the managers don't understand our pressures. And so communicating from a place of humility and framing for them what the experience of being treated by a doctor like you is and why they would want to see you where they to get sick and why they would want to send their loved ones to you, but also being respectful of, of the context, right? Like you, you can't sit with each patient for 90 minutes if you really want to practice medicine and, and show up to a job in, in, in three months time. So knowing that there are times when you can press and times when you can pull uh, will, be, will, will be valuable for those interactions. Nice, nice. Any last words? I, um, I just want to commend the, the work that you do. Oh. I've, I, I, was, I was in Boston um, from 2011 to 2016. So I was there for the Boston Marathon bombing. Oh gosh! And I uh, I remember what it was like to be on call that night and see, you know, young healthy people lose their limbs um, uh, because of uh, injuries that required surgery. And I was doing anesthesia in the OR for those cases. I was there for there was a um, and I don't mean to go in a dark place, but I know that uh, that 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 some of this is 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 likely going to resonate with your audience of folks that may struggle with burnout. But um, I was there for a patient who shot and killed a doctor, an active shooter in the hospital at Brigham and Women's um, uh, while I was there. And, and, and our team treated our colleague uh, uh, and he was a, a remarkable human, uh, the, best of, the best of us, a uh, brilliant cardiac uh, surgeon who um, had been a, an institution at Harvard and had a bad patient outcome. And, and the, the, the patient's son came by and came more to hospital and, and shot him dead. And the toll that that takes on us as healthcare providers, as servants in medicine, um, it, it can't be understated. Uh, and the kind of stresses, and, and those are two magnified examples of, and, but it's, uh, it, there's, there are microcosms of that that we encounter every day. The patient who you've treated for, for years that presents with cancer and they tell you that they've got a cancer diagnosis and no one else in their family knows. You're the first person they tell and they want you to keep their secret. And being the vessel that absorbs that kind of gravity on a daily basis, multiple times a day, it's it can be quite draining. And so knowing when you're when you need to get help yourself because of all the work that that that's that's that goes into the work that you do um, is important. So thanks for 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 the coaching, Dr. Drummond. I think um it's it's God's work, really. Uh, and I'm sure that folks are going to be um, a lot healthier and happier because of what you do. Yeah, it became my life's work a while ago. Now it's been 13 years. So I appreciate the acknowledgement. And I, I can't imagine doing anything else. I've been 100% devoted to this work since I launched the website back in 2010. And um, you you dive into something that's a whole different topic. However, there's really no way to separate burnout and the life of a doctor from trauma. And um, some 
specialty choices are much more traumatized than others. Anesthesia would be one, ER, trauma surgeons, I can keep going. You can expect to have something terrible happen, perhaps as much as a couple of times a shift. But all of us are traumatized because we chose to be a helper and a healer and because of the state of the human condition. I mean, no matter what we do, nobody's getting out of here alive. And we have to somehow come to, to, to terms with that and acknowledge that a lot of that, a family may go through several episodes of loss, but there's going to be orders of magnitude more loss in the life of a physician. And it's okay to feel for your patients. It's okay to mourn. It's okay to cry. It's okay to feel those things, even though you may have been taught subconsciously through your education. Shh, don't let them find out, right? Don't let them find out. Imposter syndrome and all of that. That's a subject for another day. It sounds like you and I might want to go into it because I actually lost uh, uh, a faculty member in a similar violent incident in my residency too. And I was in the ER when they came in. So just very strange little stories, but everybody knows what we're talking about. Let me reset. Everybody take a big breath. So Dr. Zwadi Marshall, MD, MBA, he is a regenerative spine and pain specialist in Fayetteville, Georgia. He ran a very successful little COVID testing company, and thank God it's winding itself down of natural causes, and is a principal in Doc2Doc Lending. That's D-O-C, number two, D-O-C, lending.com. I'm going to have all of the websites down below. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. And what we did today, I hope, was dove in a little bit into the, the mind of a physician business person, a serial entrepreneur, the way a mind thinks differently when you're actually developing a business rather than stepping into a practice inside some other entity's structure that was created for you. Last words. You got the last shot. I'll give it to you. I think uh, thank you for the time and, uh, and, and go out there and, and create folks and take care of yourselves. Um, uh, and, uh, and should you need to contact me, please do. I'm listed all over our website at doctordoclending.com. Okay, cool. And what I can say is that it is also true that there are many needs out there, not everything, but many needs that you may run into yourself that can be answered with a business. <laughs> so this has been Dyke Drummond, Physicians on Purpose podcast. That's it for today. I'll see you on the next podcast. Until then, keep breathing and have a great rest of your day.